Welcome to the eLaborate Topics Podcast, where we focus on lab-specific strategies for medical laboratory professionals. We're proud to be the healthcare detectives that work behind the scenes to get the results needed to influence medical decisions. Let's grow together and jump right into the lab. Welcome to another episode of Elaborate Topic Podcast. I'm really excited about this episode. Elaborate Topics Podcast is a weekly podcast where myself and my co-host Taiwana Wilson and Stephanie Whitehead bring you topics, tools, guests to help you in your laboratory journey. And today we do have a special guest that's going to help you with that. And for those who don't know me, I'm Lona Small, your laboratory coach and consultant and I'm so excited about today's episode from medical lab scientist to entrepreneur. So our special guest is Unika Alexander. Welcome, Unika. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lona. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm super excited about today's episode. Just a little bit about me. I am a, a technologist, the core of who I am. I got my bachelor's degree from Florida Atlantic University. I did my whole med tech year and rotation with New York Methodist Hospital, which is now Presbyterian, and I have a master's in biomedical science. I mentioned my experience, but I'm also the co-founder and CEO at the Proficient Lab, and we are basically a SaaS platform that's coupled with consulting for laboratory training plans laboratory competency plans and for compliance management in a digital platform. You are doing some great things and it seems as if a lot of what you're doing is related to your medical lab scientist background. So I usually ask my guests this question, was there anyone who inspired you or was there a mentor in your laboratory journey or your journey right now to be that entrepreneur? There was. I have to mention one person in particular. This person's name is Kai Reitman. He is this man from Finland who honestly saw something in me that I didn't see in myself back then. So this, he was actually the VP of operations of the second company that I ever worked for. So I started there as a tech, just at the bench. And through a series of events, we had a manager who was also a lab director who unfortunately had to take hiatus for for health purposes. And he basically plucked me out of the bench and asked, are you interested in stepping into a managerial role? And I I agreed. I took on the challenge. But throughout my career with that company, like this individual pushed me into just different types of responsibilities. And I remember the first time I asked for a raise (laughs) and he said to me, which I still quote till this day, he said, close mouths, don't get fed. I have taken that with me throughout my career as I need something I speak up, I ask for it. This individual is, at this moment, he is an advisor for the Proficient Lab, so we've kept up throughout the years, and he's just been someone who has pushed me um, throughout all of my challenges in my lab career as well as my entrepreneur career. Awesome. I hear that a lot, especially for people who stepped out on a new venture. So you're working on the bench for a while, and then you're asked to take on this new role. And the first response is, I have no experience. I don't know what I'm going to do. But when you have someone who believe in you, who say you can do it. You're probably going to make mistakes, but you can do it. Kudos to him and kudos to that opportunity, that that first step, and he continued to support you. Exactly. No, absolutely. I've definitely reached out to him for even in the conception of the Proficient Lab. I remember when it was just a concept in my head. We met, that was probably like late 2019, maybe. We met downtown Manhattan and I told him, this is what I want to do. And I was more thinking of the concept about based on consulting. And he advised that if you're going to build a business, build something that's tangible, that's independent of just you. So he's definitely helped throughout that journey. And I definitely appreciate having someone to fill those shoes for me. Awesome. So what got you interested in training and competency? 
Yeah, that's a really good question. Honestly, it was frustration. I would go from lab to lab and either training was just non-existent or competency was a mishmash of paperwork that wasn't completed on time. It was rushed right before inspections, but the actual purpose of it, which was ensuring that we have quality in the lab was completely. That's what initially got me into training and competency. That sparked that passion that as I went through, as I looked at the snowball effect of what's happening, what are the ramifications of not having training and competency? We don't have a good quality system, right? Because that is a measure of the quality of the personnel in your lab. So you have a quality system that's potentially failing because you don't have a structure set up to ensure your, your employees are competent. And what that goes into is patient care. So, you know, what everything we do is for patient care. So that snowballs into just having a gap in terms of patient care. And when we have that gap, it really leads to diagnostic errors, right? Just completely following that snowball in terms of diagnostic errors that are made, we really have about on an annual basis, it's estimated that we have what 40 to 9,000 deaths in the U.S. based on diagnostic errors alone. So that's what got me into the, the training and competency. But as we look at that, a lot of the compliance around training and competency, it really, it, it seems to me at this juncture that it's really a lab focus. So getting that attention up to the C-suite, the decision makers are, is sometimes there is a disconnect there. But when we keep following that, what are the ramifications of training and competency? You realize that there are about like about 17 to $29 billion that's paid out in the U.S. annually because of diagnostic errors. And as we trace that back, it all stems to, I'm not saying as a lab we're responsible for $17 billion, but we are responsible for 70% of the medical decisions being made. So we have a hand in that. So my frustration with training and competency, tracking what the ramifications are of that in terms of mortality, in terms of the financial aspect of it is really what helped me strike that action, but pull it together as a business and something that needs to be prioritized in the lab. And there's a lot of confusion sometimes with training and competency. I find that a lot of people confuse training with competency and they mm -hmm. think that if I can just use a training checklist and go down that training checklist, they did their competency. Yeah. And could you help? I know there's a lot of leaders, there are a lot of team leaders and just the team members could you help us distinguish between training and competency? Oh yeah, absolutely. So in simple terms, I usually equate training and competency to training to the introduction of someone in your laboratory and competency to the maintenance of their skills in the laboratory. And we find that as we look at the regulations, that training is not very well defined and for good reason. It's impossible to make a definition for training for every lab in the U.S. So the regulations say that you do need to be trained, so to speak. But when we look at competency, there is a lot more structure around competence. We have the evaluation elements. We have the timing. Timing's key in terms of getting it done within your six months and your, your one year interval. Yeah, so the, that's the big difference. The introduction of someone into the lab and the maintenance of that person in the lab. And I, what, I have this thing where I equate it to, to, to a validation and calibration of an instrument. Like you bring a new, in, I'm not saying that we're instruments, but you could make that kind of argument that we're instruments of the lab. <laughs> you bring something new in, you have to validate it, that it's able to do, it's able to function the way you want it to. But as time goes by, you have to calibrate it to ensure that it could still provide the results that you need in the exact way that you need it. Because if you don't have that continuously happening, it, you're going to veer off. You're going to veer off. And if you're, you, if you're thinking about people and the way knowledge gets transferred, like you may start at one particular place in one particular plan, but if you don't have that structured, you really in, in three, four years, you may be, your lab may be practicing complete, something completely different from what you intended. That's, I see that happen all the time, especially if it's something new that is introduced and Oh, we trained everyone. And then there's this frustration. Why is it that they're not doing it? But training, yes, people know how to do it. You check mm -hmm. them off, you observe them, you know that they got the knowledge or even the skills. 
Yeah. But are they maintaining, like you said, you're checking that maintenance, making sure if they're serving off, you're going back to make sure that certain elements of what they need to know, they're either, they're demonstrating it, not just through the, the work that they do, but how they document it, how they communicate it. If there's a challenge or a problem, can they troubleshoot through that problem? Exactly. I get it. I get that. It's, it's, we have to do competency per test system. And I totally get it. The minute you start having five, six, seven, eight tests, you have, let's say, if you start doing the math, you have 10 individuals, testing individuals in your lab, you have five test systems and you start seeing that you need to do competency for each individual, for each test system on a different schedule. It, I understand the frustration and that's why I think it's important to take advantage of what's around us to do it, but not just take advantage of what's around us, but to also have a strict to communicate those requirements regardless of who's actually doing the assessment. I think that's super important because we find that a lot of times we create like a grid or a checklist. But that really doesn't have the information we need to have a solid plan. And that's where we're coming from in terms of, we want to set you up for success, but a checklist just won't do. We need something more robust to ensure that regardless of who's looking at it, they're able to accomplish the exact same assessments in the exact same way time after time. Wow. Amazing. So you basically saw the gaps in our training and competency and you thought, let me come up with a solution. I want you to tell me a little bit about that. So you moved into entrepreneurship to provide the labs with training and competency solution. So tell us more about this. <laughs> Yeah, that's a loaded one. So I will say that it, it's not an easy journey. It's honestly not. Just making up your mind to say, okay, this is a problem I want to tackle. Take, but it doesn't happen over. I live in Brooklyn. I worked in Manhattan when I at the inception of this, and I would commute back and forth on the train. And a lot of my planning was done on the subway of New York City. If I got a seat, I would whip out my computer and start at it. If I had a break, I would start at it. It is a journey and it is about just when you're starting off, finding the time to do what you need to do to make it happen. And it is a balance because you could imagine that when you're starting on a journey, you still have a job that you have to fulfill. So it's like you have work and then you have family. So for instance, I have two kids. I have a seven-year-old and a three-year-old. So it's a lot of balancing, but every step that you could make in the right direction is the right step. I always think of this meme that goes around where someone's, oh, the road to success is you think it's this straight line, but in actuality, it's this twisty, windy, turny, just there's this tra trail of roadblocks that you have to get over. So I would say just having that mindset really helps with getting on that journey to entrepreneurship in terms of getting from A to Z. Just, I'm an advocate for being honest. When I first started this, I, I worked in operations in a laboratory and I sat with my director. I said, this is, this, these are my goals. This is what I want to do. And they were gracious enough to allow me to test the product with the new hires. And so it really helps just be honest, be open, be confident in what you're doing and don't be afraid to ask. So I've asked, so I've always held those values with me throughout the process. And here I am today, just taking it one day at a time and chugging in the right direction. So that's been the journey thus far. Yes. And I coach medical lab professionals and I always say, start within. Yes. What are your core values? What are the things that excites you? What are the things that you do really well? Even yeah. the things that you were trained, because if you weren't exposed to the medical lab, you wouldn't be able to use all these other skills to move into entrepreneurship when it comes to solution for training and competency. Yeah. So you're, it's a mix of everything that you have and we all are unique and we all have different experiences or different values, like you say, and maybe a different vision. Mm -hmm. Putting that together, bring the best out of people. And so you spend a season in the lab. But then you can support the lab in other ways, just knowing who you are 
and how you can add that to add value. And I love what you say about core values, knowing who you are and being true to that. It's true. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I'm not a mentor by profession in any means, but I have worked with a lot of younger techs. And something that I always challenge them, I always challenge them with that question, what are you good at? And I ask that because as a young technologist, as a young professional, it took me quite a while to figure out what I was good at. And I think a lot of people, when you ask them what they're good at, they're thinking of something tangible, but it's not necessarily something tangible. Like I could, I am like my superpower, I joke about this, but my superpower is operations. Like I really do understand the laboratory and I understand it from several standpoints, from regulations, from just from, from the most, from small things, from supplies, from understanding how the bench is working, understanding validations, preventative, all of that good stuff, it all comes together. So it took me a while to realize that my collective knowledge gives me that advantage in operations, but I always challenge younger individuals to figure that out because once you figure that out, like you could start building on it and figure out what the next step is. And maybe you're comfortable in the lab. Maybe this is where you want to be, but at least having that gives you some direction. Great question. What are you good at? I find that when I ask people that I'm coaching, what have you accomplished? Many times they look at me like, not much. <laughs> and once we start going back, I have this thing I call the reverse gap. Because a lot of people keep looking forward and looking at that gap, like, yeah. I don't have this. And I help mm -hmm. them look at what have I already done. Yeah. And so many times they are like, oh my gosh, I didn't yeah. know I accomplished all of that. And that gives them that confidence boost. I already have this under my belt that I can use. And so I love what you, that question when you ask people, what are you good at? Sometimes it's hard for them to figure it out initially, mm -hmm. but with time they can look back and say, these are all the things I've done and this is what really lights me up. So, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I, I, I definitely agree with that 100%. But I would say that even in, at my stage right now, looking back does provide some perspective on what accomplishments have happened. I remember for the first anniversary I put together for the company, I put a, just a slide deck together. Actually, it was in December for the end of the year, I put a slide deck together for our team and just to show them what we've done for the year and just to summarize that but even myself looking at it after i did it i'm like oh we did a lot <laughs> like it, it, in retrospect we did a lot <laughs> yeah awesome would you have maybe just a little bit more about your company so that anyone in the audience who may be interested in your solution. Absolutely. So we're basically, so what we do, so we have a two tier type of program. We have, we come in and we want to understand where you are in the process of training and competency. Do you have anything set up? So like a, an analysis of your process. Once we have that, we, we try to do remediation if it's needed. And we basically, through a series of interviews with subject matter experts, we convert your training and your competency into plans. And this isn't a checklist. This is who's doing it, what are they doing, how are they doing it, what are the instructions, what needs to be documented. And that gets put into our SAS, our platform. And we, you have all of these criteria on how the plan, like what is required to fulfill the evidence of completion. But the good thing is that the employees are basically able to go in there and put the information directly where your requirements are. So it all comes out in a neat bundle, ready for digital sign off, ready for, ready for any inspection. Once we have that, we do provide you with an SOP. So you could just add that to your documents if you need it. But the, one of the things that we're really proud of is the way our platform works. It's really a communication platform. So you're really able to communicate in real time uh, with anyone who's working with you on training or competency. You don't have to email them. You don't have to wait to see them. You could really just communicate right through the platform. We have something called a laboratory health, which basically tells you training, competency quizzes, 
this is where everyone is. <laughs> this is basically your tentative, next tentative inspection, and it just gives you an overall view of that. And something that I think we're really proud of as well is that we do understand that people communicate in different ways. And one of the difficult things about training and competence is actually remembering that it needs to happen, unfortunately. So we've used all of the tools that are available, text, calendar invites, emails, to just get people to just accept the communication the way it's needed to provide that reminder for them, whether they're always looking at their phone, whether they're always looking at their calendar or whether they're into their emails. So basically that's, that's what we offer a plan to allow for business continuity. So our ultimate goal is that if you set up this plan for your lab today and every single member of your staff were to leave and you were to hire a brand new set of individuals, those individuals could take that plan and understand exactly how to go through your lab, how to exactly how to train to perform their task and exactly how competency should be done. So it's creating an asset for your lab to remove that information just from the head of whether it's your supervisor or your manager, like owning that plan as an asset to your lab. That's awesome. You know why? Especially now with this brain drain that's happening with so many retirement. Right now we're short. Training becomes almost a burden. Yes. People are overwhelmed with training now and we're short staff and a lot of people are actually reducing the time and the effort that they'll put into training. So now we're kind of seeing the fruits of that where how come something as important or fundamental as that is being missed? It yeah. was missed during training because mm -hmm. people are busy. But if there is something like that, that set up that certain important knowledge sharing that need to be transferred. I know we did so well in our inspection the last time. A small thing that we got cited for, we were shocked. Yeah. Because it was something that shouldn't everybody know that. So yeah. those are the things that get missed when you're busy because everybody should know that. Exactly. And so we are realizing that resource shorting is affecting training, it's affecting result reporting, it's affecting so many things. So this, I think, is important at this time. Yeah, thank you. I think it, I definitely, I think it's a huge resource. And the good thing is that because and we do have staff shortages right now, but this is also a platform to allow the newcomers, the people who need to be trained or who do have competency pending to go into the system and be proactive. Okay, this is what I'm going to be asked to be trained on. You as a manager or supervisor can say, okay, go take, go take your first pass at it, get familiar with it. And when you're, when you feel a little comfortable with that, I'm going to come in and probably do some more direct observations and some more one-on-one. -on -one. So they could actually start that process independent of someone standing over them and providing every single detail because it was already captured in the system as part of the plan. Wow. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for contributing in such an important way to the lab. Training on competency, that's a major gap that we have. It shows in our inspection that mm -hmm. is the, one of the most cited thing is on competency. So this mm -hmm. is a great solution. So as a medical lab scientist moving into entrepreneurship, is there any tips that you would like to give to the audience? Yes. So I would say that just what we spoke about, if we're talking about our audience who are listening from the lab, prioritize training and competence, like it deserves the priority. You have to meet the regs, but at the end of the day, you want to save money, you want to save time, you want to save lives. So give it the priority it deserves. In terms of the younger techs who are just thinking of what are the opportunities for me, I would say to that, it's not easy. If you want to do something, you're just going to have to take it step by step. There are always going to be challenges and don't ever think that you, you can't do it. Believe in yourself. Never think that you don't have the power to speak up. And the last thing I would say is that you belong. I can't say the amount of times that, you know, throughout this journey, I've walked into a room where I'm like the only young black female in a room and I'm like, ah, do I belong here? But then my nerves go and I'm like, yes, I belong. So definitely 
you belong. If you have something you need to do, just keep chugging, do what you got to do. And don't let yourself stand in your way. Because most times we're the ones psyching ourselves out of doing things and other people probably don't care. <laughs> I love that. You belong. And I always see us as part of this tapestry, this unique pattern that fits in this quilt. And for my main hashtag is you are an important part of the whole. Yes. We need you to understand who you are. That great question that Unika asked, what is it that you do well? Yeah. Just start finding who you are mm -hmm. and just step out and we need you. You belong. I love that. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And I think once you find that it really adds to your self-worth it allows you i can't tell you the amount of times like someone tells me they would like a promotion or a raise but they're afraid and to ask for it and i i think all of that is lumps into knowing who you are and knowing your self-worth so not being afraid to advocate for yourself and for your self-worth and all of that good stuff yeah I love that. All right. Thank you so much for being on Elaborate Topics podcast. You. you really contribute some real great value. And we're here to inspire our next generation or even the ones that are here in different positions. A lot of people are like, what's my next step? Mm -hmm. I'm sure you're an inspiration. So thank you. And I'm sure a lot of people are like, I need to follow Unika. I need to follow <laughs> her. So That's how funny. would the audience get to follow you, um, learn more from you, learn more about training and the co competency program that you uh -huh. offer? Yes. So in terms of me personally, I am on LinkedIn. So definitely just DM me if there's anything you need to know, if you have any questions, any general request. But in terms of the company, we're at www.theproficientlab.com. You could send us an email at hi at theproficientlab.com. And we're on LinkedIn. Follow us. We have just information that comes through. Subscribe to, if you go on, just go on our site, sign up. We do release just some guidance, some information, and it's just a good way to, to stay in touch. But please DM me if there's anything you need to know specifically. I'm always open. I'm always ears. And we actually need more people to just band together to let's help. I think the joke that our ultimate goal as a company is to single-handedly remove competency as the top of the list for our citations. <laughs> so please, if you want to be part of the bandwagon to help our industry in that respect, please contact me. And amazing. I love that major goal. Thank you so much, Unika. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it you. was such a pleasure interviewing Unika and sharing with you on this episode of Elaborate Topics Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. And as usual, you can listen to this and other episodes on our website, directimpactbroadcasting.com or any of your favorite podcast platform. Also, we are on LabVine and you can register for LabVine. It's free to register, labvinelearning.com. And you can listen to us on VineStream, that's on LabVine, and you can access many other lab resources. Join our Facebook and LinkedIn group and email us anytime on elaborate topics at directimpactbroadcasting.com with any questions or if you want to be a guest on the show or if you just want to submit a request for a topic that you'd want us to talk about. So don't forget to connect with Unika on LinkedIn or inquire about her company. And if you want, you can also contact me on LinkedIn at Lona Gordon Small or email me at Lona Small at lonasmall.com. So thank you, beautiful listeners, for listening. And as usual, we have a new episode every Tuesday. Thank you and have a great one. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Elaborate Topics. 
where your hosts discussed relevant strategies for laboratory professionals. Please subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform and listen to us on directimpactbroadcasting.com. Stay tuned for another episode with information you can use to excel in your laboratory career.